Okay. So now this is again uh, still some sort of review of on how do we do heat load analysis. So once you do the heat load, big chunk of the project is gone. Whenever you send somebody, whenever a company sends somebody to a house for you, ask for installation or replacement. Granted, if a, if a boiler fails now or, or a furnace, it must have been installed from at least the 80s. They last long. So they will come and do a re-evaluation of your house and do a heat loss. So they will send Anatoly or Devon to go take a go, take a team member with you, measuring tapes and some sheets of paper and do the heat loss calculation. Tell us, let us know if the boiler that was installed was enough for oversized or undersized. Why do we not want the boiler to be undersized? It'll, it'll never keep up. It'll down. never keep the house. So, huh? Does that mean like short cycle? Yeah, no, no. If, over, uh, if you have the the boiler undersized, it's not going to keep up with the heat requirement. If it's oversized, then it's oversized will cycle a lot. Cycle. So come on and off a lot, and you don't want that as well. So, but having an oversized boiler is better than having undersized. Yeah. Even though it's not going to waste energy, but listen, it will keep up. And people will be at least warm, even though uncomfortable, because it's going to be too hot and too cold. So we'll talk about the methods that we can use for sizing a boiler. So there are three main methods. The first method is the easiest, the laziest. It's basically you go and you find what was the boiler installed in the house. I picked the same exact one. That's really easy. You're going to see how many BTUs. I'm not going to bother. I'm gonna put the same BTUs, whether it's enough or not. That's the easiest way to do it, but it's the most inefficient, and uh, it wouldn't take you too long to verify that this boiler is enough. The other way, which also goes in the same one over there, if the boiler was not functioning properly, you can go to every room with a measuring tape and measure all these radiators if you have hot water. That's another way to do it. And it actually it works. And based on the length of these radiators, you can find what is the BTUs giving that room. Why? Because it's not printed on it, but most of it you can look up. This is 590 BTU per foot <coughs> at 100 degrees Fahrenheit. So if you have three feet of that, how many BTUs is it giving out? Get them up to like 590, almost 600. 70. Yeah. So 1770, that's how much heat is giving out. You're gonna go to every room, measure the radiators, bless you, and you're gonna go and add them up together and find the boiler size. That is also inefficient, why? You're gonna have to oversize a little bit, uh, uh, a lot more, why? Because by the time the heat gets here, there's a lot of loss that you're gonna consider. Again, and we might have had really incorrectly sized boilers. So it will work but it's not the best way to do it. And you can explain that to people. I can do it this way. <coughs> Second method is the entire house method. We treat the house as a big box. And this is a lot of eyeballing going on. People go, oh, but who makes strategic looking at that house? It looks like a 70,000. By just eyeballing, by sizing the house entirely. Or we can treat the house instead of uh, room by room. We'll go, put say this the house, the floor plan. Here are some windows, some doors. We'll treat the entire house as then one box and do the heat loss calculation. Meanwhile, in reality, this is a room, this is a room, and this is probably a room. So you can treat the entire house as one box. It's going to be one sharp calculation. or you can do the room by room method, which the one we're doing is the most elaborate. It seems very complicated, cumbersome, but it's not. Once you know how to do it, it's really easy. You do one room and the rest will follow. But it will give you an idea of which room is losing more heat and why. And it's also good, do not skip this part, go and see the room. Don't go by the floor plan. Sometimes the floor plan has changed. Sometimes the windows have changed. Somebody <coughs> broke a window and the window has been replaced instead of double glass with single glass. Sometimes the window is boarded or covered. So it's good to go and investigate and look at things. It's gonna take a lot of time, get some energy. Don't skim 
on those steps. It makes a big difference. So three methods, using existing equipment, using the house as an entire box, and <coughs> I'm gonna give you a mystery in the numbers, and the rule by rule method, and this is the most common. This is what most companies want you to use, room by room method. There are a lot of software, there are a lot of apps, However, they don't give you all the options you need. You're gonna have to always ballpark things. Eventually, you're gonna end up off by 10 or 20,000 BTUs, which makes a big difference. It will be more expensive, it will be less ex uh, expensive. It will overshoot the heat or even not reach the heat required. Any questions? Okay. So this is what happens if you have uh, an oversized boiler. This is graph actually in your book. So this is what you want for heat. You want that 75. The system is oversized. It's gonna go all the way to 80, then cool off. Then it will kick back again, based on the differential you put in the acoustic, it'll go up again. Eventually, you're not gonna reach the comfort zone. You're gonna be hot and cold all the time. Same thing with ACs. I told about the story, I was living in a uh, studio apartments, and uh, they had this huge industrial sized AC that comes up every 15 minutes for two minutes, freeze us off, then shuts off. So the whole night it was very uncomfortable because we froze for, for two minutes for very cold air, then it's warm again. So imagine how comfortable that is. It's not comfortable at all. It's hot and cold, hot and cold, or cold and hot and the same thing. Cycling is very uncomfortable. And probably uh, by now you understand how comfortable it is to be in a same temperature, it's maintained, it's quiet, it's working the same way it's, it's supposed to. And that they see because it was so huge, every time it kicks up, it vibrates the entire building. So again, this setting is good. Of course, it's probably very humid in the apartment too. Yeah, it's humid, without condensation. And also, let's think about forced air for example. Uh, when it comes up to make up for this amount of heat or cold, cold air, it's gonna blow a lot of air. And air is very noisy. It's gonna be so noisy, then very quiet. Then very noisy, then very quiet. So again, that's not something a lot of people can put up, put up with. Question. Yeah, I wanna ask, on, why does it overshoot it? Why doesn't it just like, go uh, to the set point and just stay? It's, uh, it's over, yeah, this is the thing, but it's oversized. It's gonna, by the time it gets here, it's overheated. And if you just let it be here, it's gonna come down again and it's not going to so even if maintain. You set, even if you set your, your uh, thermostat to 75, it's yeah. gonna go to 83? Yeah. yeah, no, you can sit at 75, but then it's not gonna be at 75 a lot because it's too hot. It's gonna reach here and then come back, which is less efficient than, in, so this period here is not gonna be as comfortable. You never, you never uh, think about it, you're gonna have tips only in here and a lot of gaps when there's not enough heat. Yeah. Is that because the boiler is heating up to the BTUs, the, the oversized BTUs? Yeah. So, if you so think why, about it, you want, this is the period you want. You want to be at that period of time. If you go on with the tip here, you only have, you never reached the comfort temperature. So the owner is going to set up at 85 to feel this little bit of comfort. Then it comes back again. <coughs> you get it? And if you, if you keep it higher than that, if you put it at 95, it's gonna be here, he's gonna have more comfort zone, but again, a lot of peaks. So another example of that is, uh, do you know why your car has uh, better MPG on the highway than the city? Huh? It's very cool. Yeah, same thing. You're going up to accelerate, then you go down, you stop. You go up, then you slow down to turn. You go up and the whole, car moving from stationary position takes a lot of energy. If you have one of those uh, MPG things that is spontaneous, you'll see when you hit the gas when the car is moving, it goes all the way up, then it stabilizes. Meanwhile, when the car is already running on the highway, you only have to resist the friction from the road and the friction from the air, which is not that much. So that's why you can be in the highway doing 65 and the RPM is at 1,000 RPM. So it's more efficient. So the goal is kind of the same. If we can maintain the heat at the right place, we'll consume less energy and we will go, this is waste and this is waste.
Does that make sense? Yeah. Yep. What if you set the boiler to 70 and 80? I mean, I, I mean, not that. I guess that's the thermostat. Set. Yeah. So again, this is the where you want to be. If you set it to 70, it's not going to reach. It's a good way to visualize it. So at the end, you're going to be at some point when it's really cold and at some point really hot. Meanwhile, that's what really. So, at, but at 70 degrees of setting, you have a longer uh, comfort zone. Yeah, but if you set it at 70, it's not going to reach 75, which is what you want. Well, but I know. But what if you wanted 70? Then you would you would be more in the comfort yeah. zone, longer. Because it's it's a lot. Oh, okay, yeah. yeah, yeah. But again, look how much you wasted. Yeah. Yeah. On both sides. Yeah. Right? So this is again, if you have a, an undersized system. It's never going to reach. That's mine. Yeah, so you lose a lot of heat, <laughs> and the amount of heat you're losing is not equivalent to the amount of heat you're making. So it's going to be on all the time, which is okay for the system. It's just stabilized, but it's not going to make up for it at all. <coughs> Another example for that is when you have a heat pump. The heat pump is very good when the temperature are outside is 50 or 60, but if, when, it's, when, when it's 30, or 15 is not going to be enough. It's going to do the same thing. So what do they do in this time? They have a backup gas that will bump it up a little bit and have it subsidize the heat. Here we have the design that we want. We want a system that will ramp up from 30 or 50, slowly, 15, 20 <laughs> minutes, reach the desired temperature and stays there. So the 15 uh, minutes or the 15 minutes that we add is to bring the system up from 60 to 75 and it will stabilize there. It will have less cycling. Indeed, if you see there's some kind of cycling here, but it's not that much. It's going to go kind of around the goal. It's going to cycle, but not as much. It will be stabilized and comfortable for the entire time the system is on. Same with the ACs again. With cooling, this is another issue because you want the AC to be running, but not cycling that much. Because every time it cycles, again, it's losing uh, energy. Okay. So, another thing again, when you go to somebody's house, you have a heat call. I mean, not a heat call. Somebody called because the boiler failed, the furnace failed, the AC failed. Uh, again, we said there are two, three methods that we have to do. First, let's go and see what size boiler is there. The boiler is fine. Then, why did the system fail in the first place? <laughs> That's a very important question to ask. Just replacing without knowing why the system failed would be a big issue because the, the new system that you will put in there might fail for the same reason. Many, way, many reasons for that to fail. And uh, we'll talk about troubleshooting. I will say, always ask why. Why did the heat exchanger rust? Okay, maybe we have the wrong setting. Maybe there's a leak from the chimney. Maybe there's condensation happening. So if the system failed, if it's served for 30 years, it could be old age. But also you could investigate why. Metal, over time, it will thin and fatigue. So that's normal. And uh, the most warranty on furnaces and boilers is how many years now? 10. 10, ten is the, they find that 10 is the golden number where they can actually reimburse you, but usually they last more than that. They last 20 to 30 years, depending on how much you use them and how often you maintain them. So they do last. Same with cars. What is the warranty in every car? How many miles? Three years? Or 60,000 miles? Okay, fine, buddy. Sir, but that is a certainty that the manufacturer can be within 95% guarantee that this engine will serve you 60,000 miles or three years, whichever come first. But you know from, from experience that the engine does last uh, up to 200 sometimes, 300. There's a guy about Toronto Corolla who has over a million now. Yeah, the end of Tundra too. Yeah. yeah, million miles. So they do last. But in engineering, they have something called the fatigue cycle, which they can calculate in accuracy what is the life expectancy of this equipment. However, also depends on your performance. So. If I want to graph that as a performance curve, 
When the car is new, it can go all the way up. It will be fine. But it will degrade, 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 and stabilize. So when the car is brand new, you can floor the gas, you can do a lot of crazy stuff with it. It, will, it can take it, because it's the reliability is this high, and the equipment can take it. Over the years, it will stabilize here. So it will run, as long as you do push it. If you have an old car, pass the warranty, maybe you should try it nice. Try to drive nicer and don't do a lot of sharp curves and don't floor gas and hit the brakes. I know a friend of mine who had an old Civic who tried to do a donut and the muffler fell off. <laughs> <laughs> the, the car was good, doing okay. Just don't push it because again, they did this calculation. They did this calculation and they told you, we know that this car within the first three years is gonna be up for your abuse a little bit. So you get a new car, but again, you're gonna pay for that abuse later on. So if you have a car, usually when you buy a car, usually they tell you that I drive a car only on Sunday, it's how much they use it, how much abuse they put in the metal. Eventually, if it stabilizes at that end of the curve, it can last you for a long, long time if you maintain it. As long as you don't push it. You cannot really do the same thing you used to do it with it. It's not like everything in, uh, in life. You know, when you're young, you can do a lot of marathons and stuff. When you're older, you have to like accommodate that. It's, it's the, things do age. So why did the whole system fail? Was the system sized correctly? That's what we're going to find out mathematically. Was it sized correctly? Was the incorrect sizing part of the failure? Did it cause the system to fail or not? Maybe it was not sized correctly and kept cycling. Maybe it would have lasted longer if we have less cycling. And uh, was it designed to be running 24 seven? There are, if you look again on those warranties or in those energy saving things that tell you this, <coughs> the calculation was anticipated based on this amount of uh, my, uh, hours being, being run. When you lease a car, they give you limits on how much you <laughs> drive it, right? So okay, we're gonna lease you this car for five years, but you do not drive it more than, I don't know, was it a year, 10,000 miles a year? Yeah, 10,000 miles a year, and you have to, by contract, to bring the car for service every 5,000. Otherwise, you're gonna take the car back. You have violated the contract. Why? Because they want to guarantee there's some kind of life left in the car after you finish the five years. So that's, that's the deal. It's gonna be out of warranty, but they can recertify it if you maintain within that limit. Uh, what has changed in the first, since the first installation? That's a very good question. Did we size the system based on three rules? And suddenly we have five or six. Did we add some here? A lot of people do some additions with no calculation. Uh, I, I go back to the car example. If you have a regular car, regular truck, you suddenly realize you wanted to put a towing, towing hook on it and start towing stuff with it. This is gonna put a lot of wear and tear on the transmission. So it was not designed to do that. You had a car that had a 17 inch rim. You want it to be cool and you have like a 25 inch, uh, inch uh, rim. This is, uh, yeah, it's, it's gonna work, but it's gonna put a lot of uh, pressure on the transmission. And if you have a transmission failure, you know why. So these things are sized and calculated precisely. If you look at the door of your car, it says size of the rim, tire pressure, and even with the size of the tire, they give you the width and the rim and all other specification because this is part of the calculation. It can affect your car performance and balance. So do not modify anything before asking, or at least we know what you're doing. Same thing goes for a house. You're gonna go on, they, somebody put three feet of this radiator and you just came and decided to put five feet. Okay, yeah, you can do that. But what is the after amount of doing this modification? Probably there's some kind of ramification for that and it's not going to be always right. So what has changed since the first installation? Did we add new rooms? Did we uh, require more heat? And again, when you design a house, if it's not yours, even if it's yours, do not design a 65, even if you like, you live like a polar bear and you want to call. Think of uh, the future. You know, design for 75 or 70, something reasonable for the average human being. Uh, because if you want to sell the house and the system is undersized and your rim is kept on the boiler, it's not going to keep up. And uh, a lot of people who go buy houses that do not think about the system. They look at the walls, they look at the carpet, they look at whatever is appearing. But you should go and investigate the piping. You should go and pay somebody 
to go and investigate the, the heating system. Uh, so that could be one of your job is that to go and evaluate uh, used houses. So again, how much was uh, how much does it cost to install a new boiler and with the piping? Around fifteen grand. That's a lot of money. Question. No, I was gonna say I have an uncle that lives in Delaware. He has a big house, but he only has a space heater in his room because it's just so expensive. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's possible. Yeah, bro. <laughs> it's like kind of like living in a tent. So again, uh, survey the house. What is the system installed? Why do we need it? And again, when you want to replace a boiler, it's okay to talk to the user about the new technology. Now we have condensing boilers, and if you know about it, you know how it's installed, how much does it cost, it will be more effective for you to sell them on that equipment. Again, try to always use the new uh, controls. I mean, we all did the lab, and we saw how, how it's different from the nice control with the screen that will give you the the information that to have the old ones that's not that as accurate. So it's good to have see uh, to go and see what new technology has been there. In the last five years, there was a lot of push for energy saving. So you'll find a lot of boilers that are more efficient and they will last longer and easier to use and troubleshoot. There are actually some controls now that have a Bluetooth connection where you can go and see the errors, which is very useful. So look at the new technology. What's in there? What's uh, what is useful? A lot of people now want the, want the Nest thermostat or the Wi-Fi thermostat, which is very useful, to be honest. Uh, at least the remotely controlled temperature, so you can set up the temperature before you go home. Or, or if you're on vacation or you're away and the house temperature dropped, you want some kind of alarm. Otherwise, if you don't have somebody to set your house. Because uh, again, with the sudden drop of temperature, you can freeze the pipes and have some severe damage. Okay, so what did we learn so far? When you replace a new system, try to do the heat loss analysis. Room by room. Room by room. And so why did the system fail? What is new and available for me to replace that system with? And uh, what changed in the house since the first installation? and give some suggestions in a nice way. Like for example, uh, I've seen somebody who is trying to replace their furnace. But looking at the house, they had wood frame windows with single pane. So I'll, it will be worthwhile to say, listen, you're gonna just dump heat, you're gonna have to oversize the furnace. <laughs> Which might not be that expensive to oversize the furnace. But most of the heat is being dumped outside. And look into rebates. There's a lot of rebates from the changing windows. Windows are expensive. Remember last semester, how much is a window installed? Yeah, a lot. Around a thousand dollars for one window. So, oh, that's a good but eight thousand dollars. Let's say you have eight windows. Let's say ten thousand dollars. You're gonna get some kind of rebate on it. But if you do the math and see how much money you'll be saving over the time, and within five years, it will be worth it. Also, all windows have a lot of infiltration. Besides the transmission from the single pane, you're gonna have a lot of condensation. It's gonna add value to the house. And in some towns, you're not allowed to install new equipment to fix the windows. Uh, there are a lot of houses here. Uh, somebody called the department a couple of years ago, and they're spending $700 in heating every month. That is insane. So when we try to go and see if we can get a replacement for the furnace, your mm -hmm. master says, no, this house does not qualify because the house is completely porous, it has single pane windows, and it's not worth investing into fixing that house. It will require a lot of money to fix that house to bring it up to date than to put new furnace. Another example that you might relate to is an old car. You have an old car you're attached to, let's say a Chevy Caprice or a Rambler or whatever. You have a car that's like, okay, it's nice, you like it, but it's completely inefficient. Remember when they had that incentive cash for clunkers in 2010? The car is consuming a lot of gas. It's been designed in an inefficient way. You cannot have this car as your daily car. So maybe it's better for you to sell it and get an efficient car for transportation. Or keep that car for a weekend drive when the weather is okay and when the gas is cheap and have an efficient car. So sometimes it's just cheaper to just 
check the whole thing and start over. Uh, economics does play a part in it, and also uh, the long term. But yes, you're gonna invest a lot of money in the beginning, but it's gonna be a lot of payback. Besides the comfort, like uh, how annoying is it to have the car go to the mechanic every two weeks? Very. And they fix it, then something else breaks. Yeah, but it all depends on how much your repairs are. Your repairs are two grand. That's cheaper than buying a new car. Yeah, but what about how? What is the longevity of the car? Maybe two grand. Then you put the two grand, then the car by now is four grand. Then you're gonna go on two weeks later, and then something else fell falls off. Uh, but, falls but, apart. but because when you buy a car, let's say you buy a car for eighteen thousand, you're not buying it for eighteen thousand. You're buying it for twenty-five because you have you, there's interest on it. Yeah. And there's taxes. So well, if you buy a car for eighteen thousand, probably it's in good shape. So that shouldn't be a problem. <laughs> so again, let's look at look at the economics, long-term value. And also convenience that we also add into the equation. Convenience and uh, comfort. Okay, I think uh, that's.